Hello and welcome back. OK, in the last couple of videos, we built out and played with the initial form of the palette circuit. And I was really pleased with that because that enabled me to tick off one of the big goal items I had for the whole VGA circuit. 24-bit palettes we're selecting from 16 million colours. And today, I want to check off another one of those items. We're going to build the tile data circuit. At the moment, we have these 80 by 60 virtual pixels and that's very low blocky resolution. But my big goal was to have 640 by 480 pixels. So the tile data circuit is what's going to get us to there. Now, there's going to be a couple of compromises and some interesting features along the way. So let's start looking at what that's going to involve. OK, let's start by looking at the current configuration of the VGA circuit. The first circuit we built was the sync generator. And then we connected that to the tile map circuit, which at the time we started referring to as the frame buffer. Now that outputs 80 by 60 pseudo pixels. And I've explained a couple of times how those 80 by 60 pixels are actually just going to be the tile indices in our tile map. But for the time being, we're outputting the 8-bit data that comes out the back of the tile map directly to the palette to give us this very simple 80 by 60, 256 color frame buffer. So each of these blocks is actually eight by eight of our final pixels in size. So we just get these big chunky images out, but it's been working for us. We've done some interesting visual effects. The parrot image we've been using as a consistent test throughout the build. It's very chunky, but you know, the color reproduction is quite good now. But now it's time to build the tile data feature and try and get some of that resolution. So we're going to disconnect the tile map directly from the palette and we're going to insert the tile data in between. So the idea here is that each of these entries in the tile map, instead of providing a color directly, is actually providing an index into a tile in the tile data. So in this case, each tile is eight by eight pixels. So where previously we would have had a big block of color, now we have high resolution data. Now this isn't quite as flexible as a full resolution frame buffer, but you can think of this as kind of a data compression technique because a tile map and tile data will allow us to fill 640 by 480 pixels with comparatively high resolution data but it won't be anything like the quantity of data it would take to have a full raster of the 640 by 480 size. So now we need to think about the data format and how we're going to encode this tile data. And the best place to start is looking at the data inputs we've got. So here's the top of the tile map PCB that we designed. Now we've got the VJ tile data coming out. That's the 8-bit tile index that we're currently using to drive the palette index. But we've also got the tile XY, and that's the pixel position within the tile that we're outputting from the lower three bits of the two counters. So now we need to think about the format that we're going to store the tile data in memory. And we've got a number of options here. Now we've only got a 16-bit address bus for the entire system. So that's 64 kilobytes of addressable memory. So I'm quite keen to divide up the memory in a way that makes good use of the available space. And when we designed the memory map for the VGA, we allocated eight kilobytes for the tile data. So if we were to assume we would output eight bits of data for every pixel, that means that we would only actually have enough memory for 128 tiles at 8x8. And that's a little bit of a compromise. Now, we could probably do an awful lot of good stuff with that, but um, I'd like to consider some other options. We could have 256 different 8x8 tiles, but with just four bits per pixel each, and that's 16 colors in total. Another option would be to drop our target resolution. So if we had eight by four tiles, we could have 256 of those at eight bits per pixel. I considered a couple of other options as well. So we could go to eight by eight tiles, 128 of them at eight bits per pixel in the dynamic RAM, but then we could say maybe add a ROM circuit that gave us 128 fixed tiles in addition to bring the total up to 256, which might be interesting to do something like that with a character ROM. But that's quite a big complication to the circuit, particularly when you look at some timing specifics. So I didn't want to do that. So what I'm actually going to implement is this middle option, 
8 by 8 tiles but with four bits per pixel each. Now that might surprise some people because we've spent the time so far with 256 colors but we're going to look at some circuits after we've implemented this later on which will look at recovering some additional color data. But the main thing I want to do at the moment is get this resolution up and give us an opportunity to experiment with the interplay between the tile map and the tile data. Okay, so there are many elements of the circuit we're going to build now which are overlapping with the circuits we built before for the tile map and for the palette. We're going to use the same 8 kilobyte RAM chip. We're also going to use the same multiplexers to select between the current value on the address bus and the bit that's going to be unique is going to be the second set of address lines which are going to be made up from the tile index and the X and Y coordinates within that tile. So for inputs, we've got the 8-bit tile index, comes from the tile map, and then we've got the pixel positions of X and Y. We've got the 8 kilobyte SRAM. The tile index is going to directly drive eight of the address lines. The Y coordinate will drive three more of those, but only the upper two bits from X are going to be driving the remaining two address lines on the SRAM. Remember, each address location contains eight bits of data, which is what we need for two separate pixels of our output. So we're going to drive the inputs of an ACT157 and that least significant bit on the X coordinate is going to be the select line that will switch between the lower four bits and the upper four bits in order to create our final four bits per pixel output. Okay, now we've got a rough idea of the circuit we're going to build. I'm going to need to clear my desk away just to make room for the circuit we're building on breadboard. But before I do that, I'd like to go in, have a little bit of a look at the way the circuit's currently configured and take a look at some of the signals we're going to be working with. So we've done lots of interesting effects with beam racing by changing the registers and memory locations while we're updating the screen. But I want to look at the most simple form of the tile data at the moment. So let's just load a static image up and do some experiments. So here's our 80 by 60 256 color palette. Now you will notice if you look very closely at this that some of the glitches I had at the end of the last time I showed this have been resolved. I mentioned at the time that the multiplexer chips I was using weren't quite fast enough and I was going to get some ACT ones. So I did manage to get some of those in DIP format and I've done a short video on the Extras channel where I experimented with swapping out for those and cleaning up those glitches. Look in the description for the link to that. Now, at the top of the tile map board here, we've got the eight bits of tile index and we've got the six bits of positional data. Might be fun to experiment with that very briefly. So instead of taking it direct from the tile index, I'm gonna take two bits from there. And the other six bits will take that from the pixel index position. Ah, oh, that's kind of cool. So we can see that the XY position is being applied into the color and we're now actually driving 640 by 480 pixels on the VGA output monitor. Unfortunately, the data that we're getting for each one is replicated through every one of the tiles. And of course, that's what we're actually going to be changing when we build the tile data circuit. It's nice to see that data is coming out nice and stably though suggest the multiplexer change we made is going to be just what we need. Now I've got another issue down here I need to solve, which is the address lines and the data lines for memory. I didn't account for the fact that we would need to plug two sets in. I originally thought we'd be building these in a slightly different order and converting bits to PCB as we go, but um, I need to work out how we're going to attach two lots of address bus. And I made this tiny little adapter with a bit of strip board, which I'm hoping will let us do that. So I should have the separate set of address lines here. The palette didn't use all 13 lines, but I've got all 13 lines here for the tile data circuit. We've got a similar problem here with the data lines. I've got this adapter that I made for adding multiple mem data connections to the back plane as we had it before, and I think I can use that. I 
All right, see if we can check if that still works. Okay, that was an easy test, but you could see there it did update the memory. Clear memory, and then we can run that again just to be sure. Yep, that's working. Okay, so the other thing that's different is we need to look at the line down here for selecting the tile data memory region and make sure that's coming out right. I'm gonna fire up the oscilloscope for that. Okay, so it should be the middle pin on the memory region header. Actually, that's a slightly more convenient ground. A000 is the address of the tile data. We should be able to write anything into the eight kilobyte region there and trigger that memory region line. Okay, probably need to look at something else temporarily. All right, so that's the clock signal. So I had the scale way off from whatever I was looking at last. That's more like it. Nice clean low going signal. Now I also want to take a quick look at the memory write line. So here the yellow line is the memory region select and then the purple line is the write enable line that we need to drive into the memory chip. Now we've got a space issue here, so what I'd like to do is move the build out of the way, we'll work on the breadboard circuit on its own, and then we'll come back and see if we can work out how we're gonna connect it into all of this. Okay, I've estimated this to be three breadboards. So we need 13 address lines, eight data lines. We've got that tile index, which is eight bits, and we've got the pixel XY position within the tile. We're also gonna need the memory region select for tile data, the right line, and I think we're gonna need the clock as well. All right, so there's the 7164 memory chip. Now I'm gonna start this by trying to plan out how we're going to do this. For the address lines and the control lines, we'll need four of these 157s. Now I do have some of these chip sockets that I made up with the decoupling caps built in. I suspect we're gonna need those. And then we will need a fifth one for the output. Right, now if you haven't watched the frame buffer video where I build the original tile map, might be worth checking that out because a lot of this circuit's gonna have commonality with that and I'm gonna kind of speed past the explanation of some of it. On the 7164, we've got three data lines here and I'll bring them straight up to here, the same as I did on both the frame buffer and the palette circuit, just to put all eight data lines in a row. Work from the other way. Feels okay. Right, so we want to cross connect all of these select lines on these 157s. Actually, I'm going to put that there. That way I won't have to contend with getting the select lines across the RAM chip. Okay, so we're going to need power and ground. Now, these select lines will actually come from the mem region select. All right, so let's bridge the two sides here for the data lines. Now, in the frame buffer board, I made little shaped wires that came round here, but in the palette board, I did, did it in two steps because it just ended up being a lot easier. Poke that there for now. We know that the index and the pixel position come in over here, and that way around is what the memory chips do. Now, the data lines here, we use memory region select to push 
data from the data bus onto that. The operating principle is very simple. The select line for the memory region, which is going to come into all these select points, will switch between the address data on the address bus and the address we've made up by mixing up these various other inputs. And at the same time, we'll switch the memory chip between output to taking the input from the memory data. So we need to enable this at the same time. So I've lined it up here so that the data lines will match up with where they exist here. Pull that output enable down, and then this one will need to come from the control logic. There's our data inputs. I'm not going to transfer those lines over right now because we've got lots of address lines to bring across. Okay, so the line at the very end is not connected. That one tripped me up once before, but we do have one more address line on this side, but we're going to have to bring it over here, I think. Right, so that's all the address lines and data lines on the bottom of the RAM chip. I rescued these wires from another circuit, so that should let us connect the outputs from this line driver. Okay, so ground line there would be a funny angle, so I'm going to go to the next spot. So this output enable is actually a non-inverted copy of the select line, i.e. the memory region select. But by putting it through one of these 157s, we guarantee that it's going to change at the same time as all the other inputs. Now something I've been meaning to ask is just how much people want to see the whole process of cutting wires. For this particular video, I cut lots of wires before I started filming it and then realised that many of them were the wrong length. Right, so that's the app enable for the line driver done. So that's actually everything about the data inputs there. Now I'm curious to know if that's going to fit down there. I think we're only going to just about need the free breadboards. Okay, so right enable line. Ah, I made a mistake there. Up lines are one further along. And then we have active low enable lines. Okay, so that's the right enable line. Just need to think through the logic on that. If the select line, i.e. the memory region select, is high, that means we're reading out. So this should be high. Otherwise, it's going to be the memory right line. Chip select, we're going to want that always selected. That one's active high. Then we've got address lines 8, 9 and 11. Right, so chip select. I'm putting all the 157s on one side of the memory chip it does make some of these connections long. Should make the address line inputs easier though. Right, so output enable. When the memory region isn't selected, we want the memory chip to be outputting. So when the select line is high, we want it to be low. When the select line is low, we want it to be high. And that is, of course, the exact opposite of the output enable line that we're driving to the line driver down here, because if the select line is low, we want this one outputting. And if the select line is high, we want the memory outputting. Right, so then we've got address 10. And then we've got another chip select line. That one's active low. Pull that down. 
Okay, that's pretty good. We've got all of the connections to the memory chip itself done. All of the outputs from these, and this is fully wired. So address lines, index lines, and now we need to talk about these. To talk about these, I think we need to briefly look back at the tile map circuit. Here are the outputs. You can see those coming from the counter chips. And then the tile index data, that comes from down here at this 574, which is latching the outputs from the memory chip. So the output bits of the counters change. The low free bits go straight to this header, but then the upper bits, they go through the multiplexers into the address lines, then come out the data lines and go for a latch. So everything that's happening here is one cycle behind these original address lines changing. So what we're going to need to do is take these six lines and delay them by one cycle, and then the data will be matching in time with the outputs from the memory chips. Now I'm gonna to have to talk more about some of the timing when we get onto the final stages of this VGA build. But for now, we just need one extra latch chip that we're gonna put here in order to make the output here keep pace with the output here. Right, so I've got the 574 latch chip. Power on ground from the normal places. The output enable, it's active low, so we'll pull it down. And we've got the pixel locations from the tile. We've got two other inputs here we need to pull low. Then we've got the copy line. Just need to take that from the VGA clock. Which I'll take that away for now, but um, we know what these are. Right, so every 157 has four of these multiplexers. Now the eight outputs go to the address lines for most of them. We've got a zero and a one input, which coincides with the select line being low or high. During a write operation, it's low. So that's where we wire the address lines in. Otherwise it's high, and that's where we want our data from the index and pixel address. The least significant bit here is the least significant bit of X, and that's not going to be part of this. We're gonna to need to wire that into the output multiplexer. So the following five bits we'll take to the first five inputs at the bottom. Right, so that's the first two lines. Now it doesn't matter which of these address inputs I map each of these to. The thing that really matters is that the inputs from over here come to it in the right order. Now this is a case where having the address lines swapped over with this might be easier. How's that gonna look plugging into the board like that? I think we'll fight it and uh, make do the best we can. I think I'm going to use that one for the next. Really doesn't line up very well. I'd say that these lines, the way I've cut them, would go better the other way around.
Now there's three lines left. There's two address lines here and we put one up the top. So that's where it needs to go. OK, so that's all the read inputs. I think I'm going to attack the outputs next. Right, so we want to take the low nibble to the low inputs and then the high nibble to the high inputs. Right, so I'm going to go bit zero, make our lives easy here. Pull the enable down. Select line needs to come from this least significant bit here. So then that's going to be output zero. Overshoot and I undershoot. And the whole thing's at one over from where I wanted it. So that's the output and that's the input I'm interested in. Now, which way around is it going to be easiest to do these? Interesting, I got that one wrong. Bit one needs to go into the low input there. Because that one needs to go into that hole. The least two significant bits of the output fully wired up. I swear that for some of these wiring bits, it would actually be easier to just design a PCB. That line needs to go there. That line needs to go there. And that's going to be the easiest one to do next. Now, I think it's going to be very difficult to do these ones neat. OK, well that bit's done, so that's the four output bits. Right, so that's actually the bottom bit select line. That's quite a long way to go. It needs to come from there. Right, so now what I've got to do is just get the address lines to the appropriate inputs here and this circuit's done. Now 
these connectors, I'd rather keep them all in a row. So I'm going to cross connect the center of the breadboard just so I can fit these chips in and not uh, have any complications. I'm going to do the same on the address inputs. I'm going to come across to the first input. Second one was this side. The third one was up there. So pin 5 is next, and that comes from there. A bit more difficult to get to, but it's that one right there next to the select line. This one, seven, so that's there. Right, so line eight goes in here, getting very tight. So there's the data line, there's Eight there. There's two places we could pick it up. I think that one's going to be easiest. Right, I'm going to do 12 because that's actually quite easy. It just goes in there. I'm going to regret not doing this one before I did these ones on top. This one under here is dress line 11. Select dress input, control input, address input. And just one more. Actually, I've got that the wrong way around. 10. So I just need to go from there up to there. In theory, that's everything. Right, I'd like to find a way of testing this as much as possible before we plug it in. All right, so I'm going to try and pull all the inputs down, adding in these resistor arrays temporarily. That's the select line or the mem region line. That's the clock. That's memory data. And that's the memory write line. Here's my trusty little bus tester. Let's get a few decoupling caps spread around. I think that's everything we need. I want to see the outputs here.
Right, now it's going to be difficult to test all of this, but let's do our best we can to test some of it. Now, if the mem region line is pulled low, that should mean mem data gets asserted onto these outputs. These address lines should be pushed to all the green wires, which are the address inputs. And then whatever's here is going to be on the data outputs. So I believe the low bits here should be coming out at the top. And there we go, we're missing one bit already. Okay, so that bit is low. It's low there. Oh, it shouldn't be low here. It's actually low on that pin, but it's high there. Guessing we just had a loose connection at some point. Kind of worrying. Okay, so we should have four low bits, four high bits, because that's what I've set on the dip switches here. And then in theory, the bottom bit over here should be switching between them. So if I pull it high, Ah, of course. I need to pull this line high, but then I need a clock pulse. And now it should be these four which are setting it. So pull that low, give it another clock pulse, and we're just the low bit set. Right, so this appears to be working. Okay, well that's a bit clumsy, but Pushing the clock button here is getting us what we want. Now all my average address inputs are low, so in theory, if I trigger this line, I should have written to memory now. Let's double check that. Let's turn all the switches off. So that's still there, and that's still there, despite the fact that all of these inputs are pulled low. Okay, that's actually pretty cool. So the main decode is working and at least address zero out of 8192 is working. I'm hoping that means all of the circuit works, or at least if we've merely got some of the address lines wrong, we should be able to decode where that floor is just by looking at the output. The last thing I will do though is just add this resistor array up to the top. So now I've got a row of eight lines where the top four are pulled low, just so I can uh, use the eight bit inputs because there's other circuitry that doesn't exist yet. Let's get the main build out, plug this in and see if we can test it out properly. All right, let's try and integrate this thing. Now I did step the clock over here via a short cable, so I've got somewhere to plug that in. It's the memory right line. I can pick that up there. That's the memory region line. It's not long enough. I have to worry about that in a moment. Okay, that's a pain. It's just about long enough. But that is definitely not. That's the top eight bits. All right, I'm going to switch for that cable there, which will make this slightly more comfortable moving all the, all the way across. About the same length requirement. This is not going to finish up being very neat. Right, so that's the address bus. That's memory data. And that's the output. Now, I've made a mistake up here. Incoming lines here are not latched. So I need to put a latch between these. This is a regular 574. Right, so this is the most significant bit of the nibble. So it goes there. I 
Obviously we want power and ground to this chip. We've got an active low enable over here. And we've got four lines that I'd like to bring low. But I can use the same uh, resistor array that I planned to for that. On the plus side we now have eight easy output lines. We need the clock line to go up there as well. Okay, I don't have much else to do now but turn it on and see if the damn thing works. Right, the CPU itself is still running. We're not getting anything out the VGA but I didn't really expect that. Alright, see what we can do. Oh, hang on, we haven't plugged the memory region line in. Probably not going to help it working. Now I'm trying to think what the best way to start testing this is. So I am seeing some patterning on the screen. Let's try writing into the tile data region. Okay, now I was expecting a pair of horizontal pixels there. Now we're setting color 16. Let's actually write color one in there, but then set color one in the palette to be something a bit sensible. Ah oh, no, um, so that's the first palette entry with red and the second with white. That back to black. Okay, right, so I'm seeing some patterning that's not right here. But it's also, it's not a million miles wrong. So it should be four bytes per line on the tile. There's a good chance modifying the data this quickly, just over 25 megahertz. We're going to see some glitchiness on it. These are 7.4 series latch chips I'm using. Let's fill in the horizontal line. And that will behave as I'd like. So let's try filling in a vertical line and turning it into a grid. Okay, that's dancing around a bit. Right, now that really should be a straight grid. All right, now this feels like Maybe some loose wires. I've written a quick piece of test code that uploads this same data because I want to be able to repeat the test because I don't know whether or not the error here relates to the memory being written in or pulled back out. Okay, that's still wrong, but it's a bit less snowy. Okay, thinking about this more logically, index should be zero all the time. Which it is. So if there's a circuit problem, it has to be with the lower six lines. I'm going to make the next palette entry green. That was a mistake. 
Okay, now filling in the second line solidly seems to work. So that kind of implies we've got a problem in the lower bits. Swap this out for a faster latch chip. Ah, that appears to be exactly what we'd expect. So that LS one, once again, was causing us a problem because it just wasn't quick enough. I'm going to replace the one up here as well. Okay, now that's cool. We've got the grid that I would expect. Okay, so now that appears to be working, let's try some more interesting demos. Now we've got this eight by eight tile data, 256 of them. So very much the first thing I thought it would be sensible to do would be to create a text mode. So let's give this a try. Right, so that's clearly not working, but I can see some of the text seemingly in a good place there. I think what we're seeing here is the numbers are swizzled around a bit. I wish there was an easy way for me to capture that because maybe we could decode it. Okay, so trying to set every other pixel on this scan line now. On the output, I'm going to disconnect the select line. Low seems to create very solid output and the text is almost readable. it's slightly more glitchy. I am a little bit lost here because initial scan has it looking right. Okay, what's happened there? Now this is starting to feel like the shimmering I'm seeing is just the signals not being perfect on the breadboard but I've got some lines the wrong way round, which is causing this text to come out awful. Okay, on the third line of the grid, I'm going to swap it over to try and move the pixel one to the right. And it didn't, it moved it one to the left. Okay, the mistake here is really obvious in hindsight. Whether it's the low or high nibble on the left or the right is actually quite subjective, but obviously your software and hardware need to agree and mine don't. On the hardware, I've made it so on the left hand side is the low nibble and on the right hand side of a pixel pair is the high nibble and my software is the opposite way around. So the way I want to keep it is what I've done in the hardware but I don't want to spend the time right now with the cameras running to adjust the software. I'm going to stick an inverter on that select line and that will get things working and I'll patch up the code later when I get a chance. Okay, I'm going to put that in the hole next to it, which shouldn't be contending with anything. Bingo, suddenly my text is readable. That seems to be pretty stable. Right, now I'm going to clear the gunk back out of this.
Okay, well, that's cool. Um, now I've removed all the debug trash I put into the tile data, and now we've just got my terminal test. So I've loaded the basic ASCII characters into the tile data, and that means that I've effectively got a text mode now. And my test code I've got here, which we've had a, a little bit of a look at when it was all corrupted, is the Fibonacci sequence. So we've got the values um, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, all the way up to 46,368. So if we had a keyboard on here, we would actually be able to do some inputs on the system without actually needing the serial terminal at all. So that's pretty cool. We've got a proper output now. But text mode's cool and all that, but you probably want to see some graphics. Here's an interesting one. This is a version of the monitor that I've changed to actually output its text directly to the VGA using the character set I loaded. I've got a tiny little uh, logo I've added into the upper half of the tile data, i.e. the character set, but uh, we should be able to actually do use some of this directly now. So you can see the very bottom of the character set is still all uh, blanked out. If we move through it, we can start to see the data here, which is the actual character data. All right, I'm going to reset that and switch back to the standard monitor. I'm going to see if I get that logo loaded permanently though. Now, when I was thinking about very simple demos I could do to try this out, one thing that jumped into my head immediately was the, the very simple one-line maze programs that the Commodore programmers um, like to put together in BASIC. And that's basically the alternation between a forward slash, but a special version of it that goes corner to corner of the character, and a back angled line in the same vein. So I've created those characters and added the random number generation code I wrote absolutely ages ago. So we should actually be able to generate one of those mazes very rapidly. Oh, brilliant, that works perfectly. I'm really pleased with that. It's an extremely simple piece of code. It's just got two tiles defined, one with the line going from the top left to the bottom right, and one the other direction. Although I did um, do a little bit of color intensity on it to make it slightly smoother. But the, the net result of that is really nice. Obviously, this is the hardware scrolling I've got just panning it across. Okay, so the next demo I've got is um, slightly more interesting graphics. Now I actually found, now wanting to get a quick demo up and running, I went and found some predefined tile data with a 16 color palette on opengameart.org and the link to this particular tile set is in the description. But let's run this quick test and, uh, and see what you think of that. Okay, so this isn't like the, the greatest graphics in the world, but um, you can very clearly see this is the kind of um, base data we would need to start assembling together a, a nice little side-scrolling game or something like that. But obviously we have hit this line where we've got much higher resolution graphics than we've ever had before. Now you did see very briefly, I've got a, a new version of my monitor. Now I've directed this one back at the regular terminal, but I've still got this uh, logo I load up at the very start just because I thought it looked cool. I've got a few extra commands I've added here. Let's load that up. And I've added this command VJ show tiles. So you can see I've still got the font data actually loaded. Now I've not overwritten the um, forward slash that I added for the maze demo, but then you can see all the color blocks that uh, make up this piece of image data. There's the remnants of my uh, Jam1 logo as well at the top. 
Now, obviously, one of the things we've constantly come back to throughout this build is the Kodak Parrots image. And I did spend some time trying to get an initial version of that going with the tile data. Now, obviously, what we've got here is this kind of two layer process where we've got the tile map referencing tiles in the tile data, of which we only have 256 different ones. So we haven't got a high res bitmap surface, but we can make high res looking graphics like this by creating the right tiles. But the parrots is a generic image. It's not been broken down for us. So I've wrote, I've written some basic code which attempts to break it down into a set of tiles. And the code I've written is not brilliant. It was only a very quick first pass at it, but I'm gonna show that to you now. Okay, so this obviously looks an awful lot higher resolution. We can see a lot of detail around the eyes and just the, the back of the head and the beak. It's got an awful lot more fidelity in it. But around here, we st still see everything is very low res, like before where you can see the block grid. Now, given a bit of time, I might be able to improve the algorithm and get a better result out of this. But obviously the tile map tile data combination is designed for image data that can be broken up into that format. So very good for making kind of 8-bit style games, which is what we want to do with this system. But we can get clever and make some interesting looking stuff like this. Now, I did show you that maze demo with a bit of scrolling on it, but um, before I finish up, I did write one more demo, which I'm very keen to see running on the actual hardware, which takes that whole concept a little bit further. Okay, that doesn't quite look right. Okay, you probably saw there was a bit of corruption on the screen there. Now I've spent a little bit of time tidying that up. There wasn't anything fundamentally wrong with the circuit, but what I've done is I've added in a bunch of extra decoupling caps. I've made these little wires that um, allow me to decouple these latch chips uh, a bit more effectively. And I've um, added some extra ties on the ground lines, just because things were getting a little bit noisy and bouncy here. Because at 25.175 megahertz, we are really driving breadboards faster than we should do. We didn't notice this on the earlier demos because this new demo constantly updates the tile data right into that portion of memory that we're defining in this circuit and the previous uh, demos were just uh, updating it once so the memory writes corrupting slightly were a lot more evident with the final demo. So let's go back and look at that in all its glory. So here's my scrolling demo. Now what you can hopefully see nice and clear here is a beautiful parallax effect. What I'm doing here is I don't have two plane parallax in the hardware. You've watched me build this. I've only actually got the one tile map tile data set. But what I'm doing here is creating a parallax effect with some cleverness. The maze is created with tile data of the type that you would expect by looking at the pattern here. But then I've got a two by two grid of tiles defining this brickwork in the background. And I've duplicated that twice with the second time being darker and that allows me to create the shadow. But then what I'm doing is I'm scrolling the bricks inside the tile data in the opposite direction that I'm scrolling the main tile data image. And that allows me to create this parallax effect. And it's really quite um, beautiful, I think. I'm very pleased with that. Okay, so I did need some troubleshooting there, but we got it working in the end and we've checked off another feature list that we set up right at the start of the project. In fact, there's only really one major circuit that we're missing. Although I think now is probably the right time to start converting some of these breadboards into PCBs because making a slightly more solid form of it is probably going to help us with the overall stability of the build and not just the amount of desk space I need to fit it. Thanks as always to my patrons. I really do appreciate the support. 
and I'm looking forward to continuing the build. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.